Good morning, everyone. So sorry about our late start. Um, I wanted to welcome you to today's CMN Download Call with College Insider Chuck Carlton. We're super excited. I'm Kimmy, and I'm the Rewards Event Coordinator at the Dallas Morning News. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we are happy to have you. If you have a question, please remember that we will have a live Q&A towards the end of the call. Chuck, you're welcome to take it from here. Hey, thanks, Kimmy. Appreciate you asking me to do this with our readers. Welcome to my first conference call here on uh, uh, about college sports. So uh, please be kind. Please be patient. Hopefully I can provide you with some interesting info here as to exactly what is going on. And to paraphrase Charles Dickens, it's a time when nothing is going on, as you well know, and yet everything is going on. We haven't had the real college sports since cancellation of March Madness two and a half months ago. Yet behind the scenes, there's so much planning and discussions, all with the aim of trying to find a way in the coronavirus landscape to have some semblance of a college football season, which I think everybody wants. Admittedly, they want a safe season, but they also want one approaching the normalcy of what we've seen now for more than 150 years with college football. And after more than two months of talking and trial balloons, and I'm sure you remember all the stuff that was out there about non-conference, you know, no non-conference, conference only, even a split season, a spring season, all those sorts of things that were floated, you know, and all kinds of pessimism, and then some optimism, we seem to be getting to a consensus about the return of football and other sports in the fall. And yes, there are some outliers, like the Michigan president saying that he still doesn't see football coming back. But when you look at the momentum, you look at the power conferences, which are really the ones that are going to make the decisions, you know, in line with state governments and health officials, that I really do think we see – football in September in some way, shape, or form. Division One conferences are now allowing football players to return to campus beginning June 8th with the Southeastern Conference, and then June 15th with the Big 12, Pac-12, other conferences. Some, like Oklahoma, are waiting until July 1st to err on the side of caution. You might remember that Lincoln Riley made headlines uh, a couple weeks ago at Oklahoma by saying the idea of players returning uh, on June 1st for voluntary workouts was one of the more ridiculous ideas that uh, he had ever heard. And he's inside of definitely erring on the side of caution. You know, his feeling is that schools are only going to get one shot at this, that they really need to have their ducks in a row before bringing players on campus. Other schools and athletic directors are fairly confident in the procedures they have now. It will be interesting to see what exactly happens from there. The idea, of course, is to ease players back into voluntary conditioning, weight room workouts, then expect players to begin preparation for the season, the traditional fall camps in mid-July, earlier than usual, with two weeks of acclimation to make up for the lack of spring practice. Big question, what could go wrong? We all know what could go wrong after the last two and a half months. Specifically, what happens if a player or coach or staff member tests positive for COVID-19? Do schools shut down on quarantine? How will testing work? What happens, you know, if a player or coach test positive like on the Friday, just as the team is preparing to fly out for a game. I mean, is that game even played? These are really, really thorny issues. What happens if one school in this conference has a major outbreak or a hot spot? Do you, do you have a, a gap in your schedule? How do you deal with that? Um, remember when the Pac-12 was talking about non-conference only, you had, you know, rumors that, you know, Alabama and TCU both scheduled to open up with Pac-12 teams were talking about, you know, having to play each other at AT&T Stadium. 
to have an opponent on that weekend. You know, Oklahoma State was in a similar situation. I mean, there, these are all the things that have been kicked around, looked at, um, and will continue to be. The Big 12, if you saw today's paper or if you went to DallasNews.com, the Big 12 has a working group of five athletic directors looking at authority issues from COVID-19, from positive tests in the course of the season to, to fans in the stands. And this is a sharp group, but this is also a really daunting, you know, task that's ahead of them in terms of setting the regulations or if the conference even wants to have regulations, but certainly there has to be a framework, you know, for these sorts of things. Should they come up? The positive tests, you know, what about social distancing and fans? Uh, all these sorts of things, I mean, the, you know, and if, if you're somebody who likes college football in person instead of television, it's going to be a whole lot different. The consensus now is it will be a hugely hugely changed fan experience with starters with maybe 25 to 50 percent capacity in stadiums with social distancing guidelines. Iowa State announced this week that they won't be selling single game tickets, but they're looking at no more than 30,000 fans at Jack Trice Stadium, which seats 60,500. Again, that could change. Guidelines could be relaxed, but that's the situation for right now. And uh, TCU Athletic Director Jeremiah Donati indicated that TCU is looking at between 25 to 50%. That's kind of the models that everybody has right now. And, and again, how that will, you know, is that, how, how is that going to play at some place like Texas or Texas A&M? that routinely has 100,000 people in the stands. And, and how are you going to account for, you know, related groups that may be sitting together where you don't need social distancing and, and individuals or just one or two people, students, all that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's going to be crazy. And the other thing to look at is the financial impact. Um, at Texas, in 2018, Longhorns made $42.5 million from football season ticket t- sales. At uh, Texas A&M last year, it was $44 million, according to Ross Bjork, the athletic director. That's a huge, even for two of the most profitable athletic departments in the country, to, to have that trimmed in half or more, that's a huge cut. And exactly how they're going to react to that, exactly the effect not only on football, but all the sports and all the employees in the athletic department. I mean, football at the five major power conferences in football, football drives things. I mean, from a financial standpoint, it's it, you cannot overstate the importance of football, from a monetary standpoint, and also as kind of the front porch to the university. Yes, there are places like Duke, like Kentucky, like Kansas, where basketball is the number one sport, but that is few and far between. Football is the main engine of college sports. And if football gets a cold, a whole lot of other sports get pneumonia on all this. You're already seeing you know, a lot of non-revenue sports uh, being dropped at different campuses. Um, if if football is curtailed in any way, it's going to be far worse. I mean, I think some of those sports were already uh, on life support. You now it's a case of, you know, the COVID virus has really kind of uh, put the emphasis on cash savings on campus, and, and some of the sports that were hanging on are now facing the chopping block. It's an unfortunate side effect, but it's the way it is. And, you know, definitely – Stay tuned to how these things play out. That said, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of coronavirus questions. I'll do my best to answer them. To be honest, we really don't know right now. I mean, it is, um, you know, the ADs don't know. Commissioners don't know. Uh, They're hoping for the best, planning for the worst. In terms of the outlook for football, if we ever get to that point, and I think we will, 
it's going to be really interesting. Um, Texas A&M in its third season under Jimbo Fisher is is looking at maybe uh, its most talented roster and its highest expectations since Johnny Manziel's redshirt sophomore season. I mean, you've got you know a four-year starter at quarterback in Kellen Mond. You have 17 starters returning on the roster from a team that went eight and five against a, just an absolutely brutal schedule that included you know three number one ranked teams at the time in Clemson, Alabama, LSU, and and after you know two seasons of getting ready, I think Jimbo Fisher now feels that you know with two very good recruiting classes in tow, they may have the depth as well as the starters and the experience. Uh, you also have a far more manageable schedule with Colorado in the non-conference taking the place of Clemson, with Georgia dropping off the schedule uh, in the SEC East to be replaced by Vanderbilt. I mean, there's a very good chance that Texas A&M going into its final two games of the season against Alabama and LSU could be either 10 and 0 or 9 and 1 depending on what happens in a right an away game in October against Auburn. And uh that's pretty heady stuff for the program at this point. Again, nothing's guaranteed. Things look good at Texas Tom Herman's fourth season. Uh if anything Texas may have been ahead of schedule in year 2 with that Sugar Bowl win over uh Georgia and the and the Texas is back proclamation by uh, quarterback Sam Ellinger. Last year, disappointing regular season, which is why there are seven, count them, seven new assistant coaches on campus, and while, and why Tom Herman will probably be on more than a few hot seat lists to start the season. Same time, the, you know, Alamo, the uh, Alamo Bowl win over Utah in shocking upset, uh, a lopsided win by Texas showed that, you know, the upside for what may be coming and, and, and a resurgent defense. And that will be the key question. What does Chris Ash, the new defense coordinator, bring with a four-man front designed, designed to bring more pressure on quarterbacks? And can Sam Ellinger stay healthy? Again, four-year starter, quarterback. You know, Tom Herman calls him one of the best leaders he's ever been around. Um, a guy who, who struggled at times last year with, uh, you know, with accuracy, with interceptions, and, and how is he going to bounce that bounce back in his final season? Uh, a new core of receivers with some very deep running backs. The offensive line is it up to the standards you want in a championship contender? And and the big challenge. And by the way, if you haven't checked it out. Um, on our website, you can find a YouTube video of a 60-minute interview I did recently with Tom Herman addressing pretty much all the issues uh, around the program and a 8,000-word uh, uh, question and answer on that. Uh, Paula Luna uh, in our office, who actually transcribed all of those 8,000 words, would really appreciate it if, uh, if you uh, took the time to read some of her handiwork. But um, and again, the problem for, for Texas is Oklahoma, like everybody else in the Big 12. Sooners have won five straight Big 12 championships. Um, you know, they're going to have another new quarterback, you know, after Baker Mayfield, after Kyler Murray, after Jalen Hurts. And is it going to be Spencer Rattler, who, you know, very highly touted uh, high school player? Is he the guy? We'll see. Uh and it won't be a transfer. I mean, he, Spencer Rattler is a recruited player. It's going to be a, a different situation, I think, for Lincoln Riley. It's, again, the question is, does Oklahoma have what it takes not only to win the Big 12, but to compete on the national playoff level where they've struggled the last couple of years? And clearly, yes, LSU was a buzzsaw that nobody wanted last year. But still, that was, that was a, not a good performance by Oklahoma in the CFP semifinal. Uh, LSU looked like they were playing seven-on-seven seven football in the first half. Joe Burrow just sliced and diced that defense, which was minus 
three players by suspension, you know, injury and suspension. So, yeah, the Oklahoma still has some challenges, probably still a favorite in the Big 12, although do not sleep on Oklahoma State. Uh, Cuba Hubbard is back. Spencer Sanders is, is healthy at quarterback. Uh, Taekwon Wallace came back for his final season after having, you know, the um, – his junior year cut short by injury, one of the most dynamic receivers in the country. And, again, Hubbard, a 2,000-yard rusher. And, again, pretty loaded at every single position. I mean, this is uh, a team that, you know, definitely could – I mean, it has – you know, Mike Gundy has a perennial problem beating Oklahoma. But don't be surprised if the Oklahoma State-Texas uh, – game at the end of the Big 12 regular season determines one of the two teams that plays in the Big 12 championship game. I mean, you know, this is, you know, uh, a team that really has a huge, huge upside. Maybe Oklahoma State's best since the Mason Rudolph James Washington era or even going back to uh, the, the team under Mike Gundy that almost made the BCS on that controversial loss in Iowa State, the only loss they had all season long. Uh, Texas Tech trying to make a step forward in Matt Wells' second year. TCU is coming off a rare losing season under Gary Patterson. The track record is that TCU will bounce back. But, again, they have to be have more consistent play on offense from the quarterback position. Gary Patterson has brought in old friend Jerry Kill. Uh, the former Minnesota head coach to kind of be just, you know, an assistant head coach for him. You know, the emphasis is on offense, but he's not calling plays. But his his entire role is to free Gary Patterson up to concentrate on what he does best, which is coach defense. Jerry Kill oversee the offensive problems. You also have, you know, joining Sunny Cumby now. You have several new coaches, including Doug Meacham, the one-time former offensive coordinator back there who's back in the house. So it's kind of putting the band together and more, hoping for good things to come from that. Uh, on the basketball front, um, no March Madness, but which, you know, you're looking at Texas, Baylor, and especially I think Texas Tech having loaded men's basketball rosters for next year. Admittedly, we do not know yet about the full impact of the NBA draft, who's coming back, who isn't. Um, You would think players with solid options will probably pursue that at the next level. But still, um, Texas Tech picking up an impact transfer this week uh, at a position of need. Um, You have, you know, Baylor, which – probably would have been a Final Four contender had they had a chance to compete in March Madness. And and Texas was shock of smart, getting a reprieve and a vote of confidence and and having almost the whole roster back. I mean, it's it's no excuse this time in Austin. And uh, I see that I've been rambling on here for nearly 20 minutes. Uh, I'm uh, I'm surprised that... uh, uh, Kimmy has to hit the panic button here or at least cut me off. But uh, that's that's my little primer for you. And hopefully I'll turn this, this call over to Kimmy and you folks and feel free to ask away. Uh, thanks so much, Chuck. No, you were doing great. So I wanted you just to keep on your spiel. Um, thank you so much for all of your wonderful insights and updates. I believe we can now open it up to a live Q&A. So for those of you with a question, please follow the live Q&A instructions. In the meantime, um, Chuck, again, thank you so much for joining this call with us. I know our readers really appreciate it. Um, I had, as we wait for questions, I had a colleague reach out and ask, he wanted to know, is this the year for Texas to be Big 12 champ? What are your thoughts? This was- yeah, it's been a long time uh, when you think about it. I mean, you have to go back to 2009, the Colt McCoy era, when um, Texas outlasted, uh, won the regular season, outlasted Nebraska in that epic uh, championship game at AT&T Stadium, uh, the putting the two seconds back on the clock, all that sort of thing. Um, 
and, and since then, it's been a struggle this decade. It's well documented. Whether it was the end of the Mac Brown era, whether it was uh, Charlie Strong, uh, there was the ray of hope in year two under Tom Herman, where Texas did play in the Big 12 title game, and uh, and lost to Oklahoma, but a very competitive, entertaining game. Or last year, Texas taking I think a half step back. So is, is this a year? Um, I think this is conceivably Texas's most experienced team on paper since the Mac Brown era. I think it's clearly the best situation they've had at quarterback since Colt McCoy and Sam Ellinger, even though, you know, I mentioned their struggles last season. Um, but, I mean, Oklahoma is not going to shed that crown easily. Uh and you have the Oklahoma State factor. That game in Stillwater, Oklahoma, on Black Friday is going to loom, I think, really, really huge in terms of, you know, how that stands for the, you know, I think you're looking at two potential top 15 teams at that point, maybe even better than that. Um, and uh, I think the winner of that team is playing in the Big 12 championship game, probably against Oklahoma. Can Texas take that step? I know there are a lot of people expecting them to Tom Herman this season. People disappointed last year. You only get one chance to make the major change in the staff that Tom Herman did with both the offensive and defensive coordinator, uh, Mike Yersich, the former Oklahoma State offensive coordinator, now at Texas, and then Chris Ash, the former Ohio State defensive coordinator, the former Rutgers head coach bringing, I guess, a more, you know, what should be a more aggressive mindset up front on defense, which I think fans will welcome. But how will that play in the wide open Big 12? Those are all the questions being asked right now. I mean, clearly Tom Herman, I think, is aware of all this. He's tried to address this. Again, I refer you to that very long, very extensive interview that's available on our website. That, that gives you kind of some good insight, I think, in Tom Herman's thinking and, and what's going on. But, yes, this is an important year for him, for Texas, to take that step back when you have a quarterback like Sam Ellinger on the roster. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have a live question with someone, so we will get to that. For everyone who has a question for Chuck, Please press star six and follow the instructions. We will get to the first question. Hello, are you there? I'm here. Perfect. Uh, the question I have is this. I'm a Texas diehard, season tickets, all that stuff. But it, like you said, Oklahoma State's awful good in offense. I've read all about that. What about their defense? How are they going to be stack up this year on defense? Great question. And uh, I would almost say the typical Big 12 situation where you have, you know, the offense is going to be in the spotlight and will have to outscore the defense. But uh, while well, Oklahoma State wasn't great on defense last year, if you remember the Texas-Oklahoma State game in Austin where, you know, Texas was pretty much able, the Texas offense was pretty much able to dominate. The, the good news is that Oklahoma has – uh, 10 starters back plus a Yikes. defensive back who started in 2018 but uh, was injured this all of 2019. This, so this, the question is, are they going to be appreciably better? You know, nobody expects uh, a top 25 defense in the Big 12 outside of maybe at TCU, but can this be a top 40 defense? Is this a team that can provide enough quality stops? for Tuber Hubbard and Tycon Wallace and Spencer Sanders and company. And, you know, definitely by late in the season, we'll have a really good handle on what that is. I mean, the non-conference, Oklahoma State plays Oregon State. I don't think that's going to be a huge obstacle. I think the Oklahoma game in early November, again, Mike Gundy has had all kinds of problems against Oklahoma, whether it's Bob Stoops or whether it's Lincoln Riley coaching. Uh, I think that's a good barometer. But, yeah, this is, you know, I think Oklahoma State starts the season in the top 25 and deservedly so. And then we'll see what happens. Also, 
you hate to speculate about the injury factor, but last year they lost Tyquan Wallace middle of the season to an injury. Spencer Sanders wasn't available late for the bowl game. Uh, Chuber Hubbard is just a dynamic running back. But he's going to get an awful lot of carries. Defenses are going to get a lot of shots against them. I mean, there's a lot of wear and tear on running backs. So those are all key points for Oklahoma State. But, yeah, the – you know, I think in terms of being a Texas fan, yeah, you not only have to look at Oklahoma this year, but definitely Oklahoma State. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. We have another live question. You should be on the line now. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. What, how do you figure the Dave, Dave Aranda at Baylor? I mean, what, what do you see about the Aranda hire and where will Baylor kind of line up? Yeah, again, the one good thing about Baylor, and I, you know, first I guess just addressing the hire itself, I think uh, Mac Rhodes, basically, you know, this is as good as Baylor fans could have hoped for. I know you're dealing with a first-year head coach, somebody who had been a long-time assistant, no head coaching experience, but Dave Aranda had really been this huge rising star as a defense coordinator. You know, at Wisconsin, where he produced top ten defenses. Yes, I know it was in the Big Ten, so you know, it's coaching defense in the Big Ten is kind of like coaching offense in the Big Twelve. You're you're expected to have those top ten numbers, but yes, he's a sharp guy, young guy, dynamic. Um, went to LSU again, coaching different kinds of athletes than in the Big Ten, but had all Americans was part of a national championship team at LSU. And even though that defense, I think, struggled early, uh, especially you can look at the Texas game, the Alabama game, when it came to crunch time, you know, in the SEC title game and the two playoff games, LSU defense reverted to form. That was a really salty, good bunch that clearly did not take a step back to the offense. And dynamic guy coming in. I mean, the the biggest challenge for him so far is he hasn't, you know, ever had the chance to be on the field with his players yet. They hadn't even started spring practice when the uh, moratorium came down because of the coronavirus. I mean, you know, so he, he's been doing a whole lot of Zoom calls, a whole lot of coaching remotely, a whole lot of trying to make connections here, he and his staff, uh, Larry Fedora. Coaching the uh, coaching the offense, the former North Carolina coach, uh, a guy who I think is going to bring maybe a different offensive scheme in than the one Matt Rule ran. But you do have Charlie Brewer at quarterback again, multi-year starter there, a leader with Brewer. There has been an injury factor, but I think um, if he stays healthy, yeah, he brings. That consistency. I think the offense will be fine. The good thing about Dave Aranda is his expertise is on the defense. But the bad thing is when you look at all the losses that went out the door, um, I mean, you know, Terrell Bernard is back at linebacker, and he was a revelation last year when Clay Johnston got hurt. Outside of that, you know, I mean, you've got an impact transfer from Arkansas State, an edge rusher that I'm sure Dave Aranda will do all kinds of nasty things with. But as a whole, yeah, it's a a rebuilding process, and it's uh, the sort of test of what depth that Matt Rule left behind. You know, I think he had done a good job of building up players, developing players in his time there. But there are going to be a lot of players having to step up now. And remember, that defense was kind of the hallmark of last year's Baylor team, just a very physical defense, especially up front, one that dominated Texas late in the season. So those are sorts of things. If you're a Baylor fan, you have to be encouraged as well by what Dave Aranda is doing on the recruiting trail. A whole lot of energy. I mean, Baylor had been, under Matt Rule, had been in the sort of identify players that fed into what they want to do, develop those guys that went well. I think Dave Aranda's maybe shooting a little higher in terms of the actual talent, at least if you're looking at recruiting ratings. 
And, and so far, again, it's early in the process. Things can change. But he seems to be having an awful lot of success out there. Does that help? That helps. <laughs> Awesome. We will move on to another question. Um, so I had another question asked. Um, will the strength of non the non-conference schedule ever come back to bite OU and OSU? It seems Texas is lining up teams that give them a challenge, and the other schools are playing layup games. Thoughts? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> and I will give Oklahoma credit. In the past, you if you remember – um, the Baker Mayfield era, you know, playing home and home against uh, Ohio State. That's not a layoff game. Um, but I think, I mean, as we've seen in the, uh, you know, from the college football playoff, uh, they do look very much at the non conference schedule who you played, who you beat, kind of the aspiration there. And in the case of Oklahoma State, it hasn't been, you know, exactly, you know, the same level as maybe some of the contenders, but it's still pretty solid. Oklahoma has always tried, like I said, with the Ohio State scenario. Uh, I mean, they they scheduled UCLA uh, a couple years ago in the Kyler Murray era. Uh, nobody thought UCLA would be that bad. The game this year is against Tennessee which some people see as maybe a potential contender in the um, in the SEC East. But, you know, again, when you, these are games are made, you know, six, eight, ten years in advance, you're thinking Tennessee is one of those programs that you want to play in, in the Southeastern Conference. Again, uh, Oklahoma will be rooting, I think, for, uh, for Tennessee to have a strong year, just on the basis of that. And also, if the game comes off, they're playing at Army, which is always problematic, a wishbone team, on the road, that kind of atmosphere. I mean, it's not, you know, exactly the huge, huge showdown game, but you give them credit, Oklahoma, going out there and playing that sort of game. But, yeah, I, I think if it's Oklahoma State, they're in the playoff mix late in the season, the strength of schedule that Oregon State game may get a lot of scrutiny. Thanks so much, Chuck. We'll go ahead and wrap this up for today. Um, I just wanted to thank you for joining us for this call for our readers. I know they really appreciate it. And um, for all of our readers, thank you all for joining in on, uh, on as well. And um, we're thankful for each and every one of you. For those of you who called in early and heard our Alexa briefing, we will be sure to send out information on how to access those after the call. Um, Chuck, do you have any closing thoughts for our readers? No, no. Uh, thanks for... Uh, thanks for being with us, and um, uh, bear with us. Football, I believe, is coming. I can't say that with 100% certainty, but if you've been in withdrawal, I think we're going to have live, live sports sooner rather than later for to watch, write about, and discuss. Uh, and hopefully you found this interesting, enjoyable. Uh, I thank Kimmy for putting up with me on this uh, and, and guiding me through it and, and doing all these things. and, and also take advantage of, of all these calls that we're doing. Uh, we have people with a lot more expertise than me uh, on their subjects doing this. So, uh, uh, And it's our way of giving back. This has been a difficult time for, for everybody in our community, and we appreciate you supporting us during this time. And, uh, and, and thanks for all those who listened in. Thank you so much, Chuck. For future DMN download calls, everyone, and other important information, continue to check out our weekly rewards newsletter on Tuesday. To stay up to date on new developments with the coronavirus, please sign up for the coronavirus newsletter. I'll be sure to send out information on how to do that after the call. Again, we wanted to thank you for joining us for today's call. If you aren't a member of the Dallas Morning News, we are glad that you were able to jump on today. And we hope that you will continue to support local journalism by subscribing today. Stay safe and stay well. I'm signing off. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Chuck. Thank you, Kimmy.